Welcome to In Studio from Simply Timeless. I'm Jade Daniels. Thanks for taking a few moments to be with us here on the radio. One of our dear friends is the jazz pianist and vocalist Lauren Lee. Several years ago, she moved to the Big Apple from the Midwest and since then has become quite a fixture on the local jazz scene. She's not only a talented performer, but also a well-known educator, having provided master classes to several organizations around the world. Recently, she released an album filled with her own original concepts. The album is called Window Sills, and it features what she calls vocalized instrumentals. I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that in just a few moments. But right now, let's hear Lauren's story of how music brought her to the big city. So I'm from Southern Illinois. <laughs> Originally, I grew up in a cornfield, for lack of a better term, a very rural area outside of St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I went to college or undergraduate college, I guess, in St. Louis at a conservatory called Webster University. And then as soon as I graduated, I moved to New York. So I was very like quick succession. I definitely grew up in a place where there wasn't a lot of anything happening, but especially not jazz, which is a shame because like, uh, as I mentioned in the cafe, like Miles Davis is from Alton, Illinois, East St. Louis, Illinois, and where I grew up isn't too, too far from there. It's about a, an hour away. And, but if you, if you said his name, nobody would know who he was, like where I'm from, which is a shame and a half. Like, it's really embarrassing that you have this amazing, groundbreaking musician that grew up right in your backyard and you don't even know who he is. So if no one in Alton, Illinois knew who Miles Davis was, how did you find out about Miles Davis? I went to, well, start a little bit earlier. When I was in high school, my parents would let me take music lessons at Southern Illinois University, which was a bit of a drive from where we were. But really, if you wanted to do music stuff, you kind of had to leave the, the super rural and go to the more, more suburban, I guess, area. Um, and I was taking lessons with a teacher and I was taking classical voice lessons. And when I got to be about like 16, 17, like my voice started to mature a little bit and singing classical music wasn't as fun for me. So she was a classical singer, but she was like, okay, well, what do I do with you if you don't want to sing classical music? And she gave me a CD of Ella Fitzgerald being like, here, go listen to this. And I went home and like, I wore it out because I was like, okay. And then after that, I started learning about jazz and I, I really liked it um, and I ended up going to school for it and that was where I started to actually learn who was who and who played what and all about all this you know, cool stuff that has since become my life so I guess it all started not even with Miles but it started with me getting disgruntled with classical music. Ella of course one of your great inspirations one that you still emulate through a lot of your work, especially through your scat solos. Who are some of your other jazz inspirations? And not just vocalists, but also instrumentalists, because yeah. you are a talented pianist as well. Oh, thank you. So Bill Evans is one of my favorite piano players, always has been. I think most jazz piano players say that because he's like, he's the top tier for, for a lot of us where we're like, it just doesn't really get any better. And I, I feel similarly about Ella. Um, but there are a lot of musicians that I put on that level with them, like Eric Dolphy, Thelonious Monk, Train, of course. Um, I mean, that was like the, I guess my top five when I was, uh, I guess, first starting to get into jazz and things like that. But I also really love Andrew Hill. I love Joe Henderson. I love Nancy Wilson. I love Lambert Hendrickson Ross. We're talking about like scat singing in particular. They were a big influence on me when I was in college. I listened to them constantly. Anita O'Day, I love. And I wish, I mean, there are a lot of people that like, because I grew up kind of rural and also I kind of came to jazz later than a lot of my peers did because of like growing up rural. And then when I was in undergraduate, I started as a classical musician more than a jazz musician. Like, 
I feel like there were a lot of people that I really love now that I'm like, man, I wish I would have heard them when I was younger. Like Anita O'Day is somebody that really comes to mind for that. Because I'll listen to her now and be like, oh my God, why wasn't I listening to her when I was younger? Like, she's so great. What was I doing? I wasn't paying attention. Like, so I have all these like coulda, woulda, shoulda moments on people like that, I guess. Did you always uh, sing while you were playing the piano? When did those two come together? Those two, I mean, they kind of came together when I was in high school. Not in the same way that I do now, but I I did a lot of, like, competitive singing stuff. Like, not solo singing, but, like, competitive, like, choral singing things, like state contest and, and things like that, because that was really kind of the only opportunities that were available um, when where I grew up. So I always wanted, I didn't just want to be in the choir I wanted to be the first chair person of who I am as a person I'm competitive um and I usually sing like second soprano which is a little bit harder to hear so I would practice singing my second soprano part and then playing on the piano the first soprano part or the first alto part or the second alto part or all of the parts and see if I could sing against it and I really think that that set me up for what I do now, which is play the piano and sing groundbreakingly at the same time. So I started playing and singing together just because I I was mostly only singing before that. I wasn't playing as much piano and I really missed playing piano and that was why I started doing it together. And like also I had been really influenced by people like Nina Simone, who is amazing. Uh, she's an amazing piano player. Um, so I wanted to start doing more things like that, and I thought it was practical too to do that because I could have one less person in the band to worry about having to pay, which is helpful, uh, or I could do solo gigs and actually be confident about it, which was good too because I didn't want to, I didn't want to halfway play piano or halfway sing. I want to, I, if I was going to do both, I wanted to actually do both and not be like, oh, well, I kind of sing, or oh, I kind of play piano. Like, I, if I'm going to do it, I want to actually do it. And so that became my thing. And I was like, oh, I got to shed and get this together. Really, like, work hard on this because I want to feel confident in have something to say on both instruments. And that became very important to me, and that definitely became my goal. And so now I work in ideal situations, I'm doing both. You're listening to In Studio from Simply Timeless. As we come to you from the Bronx, we're speaking with pianist and vocalist Lauren Lee, who uh, just released her latest album called Windowsill, featuring her own original works. We'll talk about that in a few moments. What did it take to get you from Alton, Illinois to New York, New York? So my actual hometown is called St. Jacob, Illinois. It's much smaller than Alton, but it's close. It's close by. It's it's a... Uh the town had like 800 people in it and we lived outside the town anyway um but I moved to New York in 2009 to go to graduate school at NYU um I was really excited to have an excuse quote unquote to leave uh the Midwest and graduate school seemed like the way to do that so when I was applying to schools I applied to a bunch of different schools but I was most excited to go somewhere in a place like New York. And when I got the acceptance letter from NYU, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. And I've stayed and it's been cool ever since. What were some of your struggles when you first arrived? I mean, it's not easy to get a start in New York. I was totally blindsided by how expensive everything was here. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> like, I, I remember looking for apartments, because I, I mean, I was living in St. Louis City before I moved here, and I had, I've lived in a house with a couple of roommates, and we were only paying, like, I think total for everybody in the house, I think we were paying maybe $700 or something like that. You can't get anything for $700 here. No. So I remember, like, looking at all these, like, scam apartments on Craigslist thinking that oh I can totally get something for you know this much money and then I moved here and I was like oh and so I actually my first apartment here I had a really nice room that was really far out in Brooklyn and in Midwood Brooklyn which is like pretty far down 
Um, but my room in that apartment was so nice. It was one of the, like the nicest rooms I've ever lived in. It had windows on two sides, which is like totally a luxury here. But it was, I mean, doing that, like taking the subway was new, trying to get around. I was lost the entire, like probably first six months I lived here. Like I just didn't know where anything was and I wasn't used to like having to take the subway everywhere. And I wasn't used to like, there not being any space because like I grew up in the middle of nowhere like you can swing your arms around and not hit people but you can't do that here <laughs> so I had to totally change how I walked I guess um yeah and it was just it was just a different lifestyle like everything everything about what I was doing kind of had to change when I moved here just because of like the economic factor and the lifestyle factor was very different like I wasn't used to having to walk to get groceries or walking to go to school it was just like oh well you just drive there and you just park and like you go in and like here that was not the case so and and the whole thing with parking that I found is that you need to do a lot at least 15 to 20 minutes yes so I didn't get a car here until very recently, a couple, uh, about six months, almost a year ago now, actually. Uh, driving here now is less scary, but when I first moved here, I vowed that I would never drive here and then look at me driving around now. But yes, parking is iffy. <laughs> and you came here for grad school at NYU, mm -hmm. but you never left. How many years ago was it that you arrived? I arrived 10 years ago. Now, now we can't obviously investigate every year. Right. We haven't the time, unfortunately. I'm sure there are a lot of great stories. But now within the jazz community, you have come to be one who is well respected by many as being one who not only injects your voice into your music, but also is an innovator in your own way. I mean, your latest album is proof of that. Um, it certainly shatters some of the norms that singing pianists are well known for. How would you define your sound as far as the influences that you have gained over the past 10 years here in New York? So when I went to create window, well, actually, I never went to actually create windowsill. It happened organically. I was at an artist residency in Switzerland, and the, the deal with the artist residency was that you had to write music to premiere in the town where the residency was. Um, I didn't go there with the intention of writing an album, but I was writing these pieces that all kind of fit together because of what I was thinking about at the time and, and things like that. But it was interesting because I was listening at the time to a bunch of different stuff that wasn't even jazz. And I always kind of do that. I try to listen to a wide variety of music just because it makes things more interesting, uh, both musically and in regular life. Um, but... The pieces that I was writing all seemed to fit together and they were all about like wanderlust and travel and trying to find different things. And that's definitely, it's not just how I am as a person like in, oh, I want to go to different countries and do the thing. But it's also about me musically. Like I'm, I'm very much somebody that I'm always looking for something. I'm not happy staying still or staying the same. And so I would describe like my style, I guess, as being adventurous and being open to trying things. I always want to try something. When I practice, I try to practice things as many different ways as possible. Like in terms of practicing scales or practicing arpeggios or practicing changes for a tune. I try to practice things as many different ways as I possibly can so that I could see all of the potential possibilities. And that's impossible if you're an improviser, like there's always going to be something different. Um, so I'm always looking for those different things. When I play and sing at the same time, or when I, I guess when I sing mostly, um, a lot of the times it was without lyrics. And I call that vocal instrumentalism because I'm playing the vo my voice as an instrument. I'm still telling a story. I'm just not using language. And that's different from scatting, which... Which is improvised. And that's that's kind of the thing. So I sing a lot of melodies without lyrics just because if I'm going to write a tune with lyrics, 
the lyrics and the melody have to come at the same time. Otherwise, it's not going to fit. It's going to feel forced. And it's not going to, to me, it's going to feel forced and it's not going to sound very good. Um, so when I write a tune, if it doesn't have lyrics from the very beginning, it just doesn't have lyrics at all then. And I'm like, well, I'm telling the story in this way instead of with the help of words. And so vocal instrumentalism, it's not really trying to make my voice sound like an instrument, although I do like to joke around that I swallowed a clarinet. But I didn't. <laughs> so it's more of a, well, I'm trying to tell the story the same way an instrumentalist would. I'm not using words, but hopefully you'll get the vibe that I'm going for. And I think on Windowsill, I did achieve that based on the reviews that the record has gotten. Like, oh, it sounds wander lusty and I'm like cool worked out but it, I definitely part of that is trying to work with what I have as as a vocal instrument like I don't have a huge voice I don't I'm not a belter I don't have certain expressive things that one might expect from like a quote-unquote jazz vocalist but what I do have is a lot of agility and flexibility and range and creativity and pursuing this like vocal instrumentalism route definitely fits me better just fits my vocal fits my instrument better than if I was trying to force it to do something else how do your life experiences impact your compositions so on windowsill that record all of the tunes are more or less about life experiences I try to write about what I know I don't know a lot so the songs are all kind of about the same sort of topic but I try to I try to write about broad topics so that it's more I guess interesting to people who are not me um and by that, I, I mean, I'd like to write about, not about emotions necessarily, but about, I guess about experiences, like the experience of going somewhere new for the first time, or the experience of falling in love with somebody for the first time, or the experience of being all alone by yourself in the Alps for the first time, or whatever the, the, thing, the thing is. Because it's, it's an interesting way to try to capture a moment. Because then when I hear the song again or I play the song again, I'm like, oh, I remember how that feels now. Because there's a lot of tunes that I have very specific, other people's tunes, not my tunes, but tunes that I have very specific memories from. One of my favorite stories about that is one of my favorite records of all time is this quartet. It's called Quartet Live. And it's Pat Metheny, Gary Burton... Antonio Sanchez and Steve Swallow and I remember listening to Sea Journey and Falling Grace on the F train going oh not going over the bridge but going under the water on my way to go get a root canal <laughs> Lovely. and but I was I was terrified because I'm like oh a root canal sounds terrible I don't want to have that um, but I had my tooth was messed up so I had to get it and I remember listening to those two tunes and now anytime I hear those songs I have that memory and it but it's a good memory I mean the brute canal was unpleasant but those songs really comforted me in that time period and so now I have that memory I'm like oh this is the song that I got the root canal to like my I think like having those like associated memories is something interesting and I have other examples but that was the one that I think is funny so <laughs> that's the one that I use um, but the tunes on windowsill I have memories like that too like for example uh, the song get off me I wrote during this artist residency I was spending all this time alone because I did the residency by myself um, and I was watching some TED Talks on YouTube, which I'd never watched before and really haven't watched since, honestly. <laughs> um, but I was watching this TED Talk by this woman named Whitney Thor, I believe is her name. She has a TV show on TLC of some sort. Uh, but she was talking about shame in her TED Talk. And the way that she worded it was so eloquent. I'm horribly paraphrasing 
but she would talk about the shame that she felt as like a young girl, like teenager age and, and things like that, about packing shame into her suitcase and carrying it around with her wherever she went and how it impacted her life and how now is however old she is. I think she's probably like our age or maybe a little bit older. And she's like, oh, I don't feel that shame anymore because I told people to like leave me alone and, and whatever. Again, paraphrasing horribly. But I thought that the way that she worded that feeling was so spot on. It made so much sense. It was so cool. So I had this idea to write a tune that sounded kind of the way that Get Off Me sounds. But again, like I said before, if it doesn't have lyrics from the get-go, it doesn't have lyrics at all. So I tried to kind of summarize what she said in her TED Talk and turn it into the lyrics to Get Off Me. And it kind of plays with the idea of, oh, I'm ashamed of myself for these reasons. I feel shame for these reasons. I feel aggravation for these reasons. Here's me trying to pretend that I care that, you know, you think these negative things about me. And then here's me telling you to get off of me, get lost. I don't care what you think. So you find that this message, even without words, can still come through with just music to the listener. It can, like that's definitely, like that tune in particular, Get Off Me, that one does have lyrics. But I feel like in general, there are other tunes on, on that record that don't have lyrics. And I think that the message can still come through just based on the shape of the melody. Like I think all of us, when we hear melodies, whether we realize it or not, they do make us feel a certain way. I think, I think, I mean, and, harmony in the same way like maybe sometimes when people are listening they're not in tune to that but for me I definitely I listen to a lot of music that doesn't have lyrics and the music definitely makes me feel a certain way or like it's trying to tell me something Um, and that's something that I'm really into exploring using the voice as like a textural element or singing the melody but not using words to get the point across because I mean it's the same way that somebody can tell you everything you need to know with a sigh if they're like if you're like how you doing Jay and you're like Ugh. you didn't say any words but I know exactly how you're feeling and it's kind of the same thing you're listening to in studio from simply timeless our guest pianist and vocalist Lauren Lee when a listener approaches your album and I say approaches for me even, one who has been listening to jazz for several years, I had to become acquainted with your interpretations, Uh your way of approaching a certain song. Uh So when the listener approaches the album, how should they, what should they be listening for? How do you think they can best connect with your music? So, I mean, I think anybody who's looking for listening to something that if they're if they're listening to a lot of singing pianists i would encourage them to listen to window still with an open mind because it's not what you think it's going to be necessarily there's definitely a certain thing that people expect they expect like a diana crawl or they expect like a nat king cole and i'm not doing anything like that um i definitely Mel- I mean, my kind of motivation in in jazz and any style of jazz is melody above all. I love things that are melodic, things that go places and, and things that are welcoming to listen to. And I think if a listener approaches my record just with the notion that they're going to go on a journey, that they'll find something about it to enjoy. We've talked about the stories uh-huh. behind your compositions, but the overall album itself, Windowsill, what's the story behind that? So the, the album got its name actually because my cat, Smeagol, who's awesome, he's the best cat, he likes to sit in the windowsill behind my piano and look out the window. And I always wonder what he's thinking about because he's a cat, he doesn't talk obviously. But I'm like, oh, I bet he thinks he's like a big cat on the savanna looking out the window being like, I'm going to pounce on those birds and I'm going to eat them and I'm going to do all these like big cat things, even though he's like, he wouldn't last a second (laughs) outside. Um, 
And so, like, looking, looking at him with, like, this wonderment on his little cat face, I was like, that's the tune. Because it, that ties back to me growing up in a rural area. I spent a lot of time in the car when I was a kid driving through nothing because there wasn't anything. It was just, like, corn or soybeans. And you'd look out the window and you'd be like, man, I could be literally anywhere and it would look the same, like anywhere rural, it, it all looks the same. And so I used to look out the window and pretend that I was somewhere else all the time because like, I I mean, I'd, rural living is not for everybody. It was not for me. I really didn't like it. So I often would use the coping mechanism of, for boredom, I guess, with pretending I was somewhere else. And so when I would watch my cat doing that outside our living room window, I was like, huh, I used to do that too. And that became the overall like tie-in for the record. And on the title track, Windowsill, when I was recording it, that's what I was thinking about was, you know, what kind of music would I want to have like as a soundtrack to say 10 or 12 year old me staring out the window of the car looking at the endless miles of corn do you still look out the window in queens i do the view is a little different now (laughs) what do you want from your life both personally and professionally as you look out the window sill i want opportunities to travel and i want opportunities to do as many different interesting music related things as I possibly can but I mean I love doing standards too I love playing other people's music I love doing my own music I love writing music and these things are definitely possible when you're not alone and having Andrea has been an inspiration to me because I never thought I would have that. I definitely, I mean, I grew up in the Bible Belt where it's maybe not cool to be queer. And I never thought growing up there that I would ever have this. I thought I was just gonna be like closeted and miserable. And that's like, it's it's not something I talk about a ton, but it, I mean, the tune so long on windowsill is about that it's about that feeling like oh i waited this long to be able to have this and talk about this and and it's definitely been a force in my life so i you know i want the two of us to go on and see the world together and have a great time and you know professionally i you know i want that to be part of the reason why we get to do it because like traveling and music go together so well and a lot of my favorite memories are ones where I got to travel and make music so I want to do that with her. And Andrea does go with you to a number of gigs in fact that's where I met her was at Silvana in Harlem Uh, so you're very blessed in that regard. One final thought why music? I don't know what else I would do. (laughs) Like, I I think about that a lot because I used to make a terrible joke, self-deprecating joke. I'm like, I'm going to quit music and go be an ophthalmologist. And, like, I would be miserable because I don't really even think about anything else. It's, I mean, it consumes every fiber of my being. I get up in the morning and I'm like, oh, I got to practice because I have this stuck in my head. And if I don't work on it, it's never going to get out of my head. And like, it's a constant like chase for, to make things sound a certain way and to find these things that I want and grab them. Um, But I would, I mean, I don't know what I would do. I'm so, I care so much about the art form and I care so much about creating things that are new or doing something different with things that I already have, I guess, in my toolbox. And it just, it gives everything that I do purpose. It's like my reason for getting up in the morning. I don't really know that any other type of art form or career could ever do that for me. And I don't really want to find out either. Um, Because I just can't see myself caring about it as much as I care about jazz. Lauren Lee, our guest this week during In Studio from Simply Timeless. Be sure and check out her website, the address laurenleejazz.com. 
And there you'll find more information about her music and also uh, her new album. Again, the title of that is Window Sill. Thanks so much, Lauren, for taking the time to meet with us. Until we meet again, my name is Jade Andrews. Thank you for joining us in studio.